Today, there's a new look to the ethnic mix of Boston. Blacks, Latinos, and Asians are growing in population and gaining in influence. These people add new colors to Boston's changing face. For the past 10 years, Boston has been called a racist city, a place where ethnic minorities were unwelcome and unsafe. But now, when people describe the racial climate of Boston, they speak of binding the wounds, tolerance, harmony. And there is a guarded air of optimism that Boston may be working toward creating an environment that includes rather than excludes people of color. I'm Liz Walker, and tonight we'll explore the agents of change that help reduce Boston's racial tensions. We'll examine the changes in city government and its policy. I think that this city uh, has to have uh, a, a policy where everybody's rights and everybody's opportunity to have access and to frequent any place in the city is, is absolutely paramount and it's critical. Without that, nothing is going to fall in place. Access is the, is the key issue. The changes in business practices. I have been very, very surprised and very, very pleased at the amount of support that I've gotten here at this bank. The changes in the demographics of the city and its effect on politics. Something has to be done, and I was watching the Democrat convention going on, and it just got you all psyched up to do something about it. We'll look at how all these factors impact the quality of life for Boston's minorities, but we'll also see why these changes may not be more than just a glimmer of hope for the black, Latino, and Asian populations that make up Boston's changing face. We'll begin in just a moment. Lenny Wiggins is an assistant vice president at Shawmut Bank. Mike Fortune is a union trainee. Lei Mei Yu has a steady job with the new Marriott Hotel. And Carmen Pola runs the mayor's office of constituent services. These people all hold jobs in Boston today that probably wouldn't have been available to them just 10 short years ago. Boston is fast becoming a thriving center of commerce, but it is a city caught in conflict. Boston has a reputation, a reputation of systematically excluding blacks and other minorities, and a big part of that happens in the workplace. Compared to Boston's white workers, minorities have fewer job opportunities, lower incomes, and double the rates of unemployment. As a matter of fact, although one out of five people in Boston is black, whites rarely work side by side with blacks and almost never see them in positions of authority. Federal statistics compiled by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission show that today, Boston is the most difficult metropolitan area in America for a black person to get a job or earn a promotion. I was never told in any circumstances that my credentials were not exemplary. Last year, after successful career stops in New York and New Orleans, Lenny Wiggins decided to try her luck with the banking industry in Boston. Her friends and family told her she was crazy. After spending twice as long as she had anticipated looking for a job, she wondered if they might not be right. My resume could stack up against most of the people in most of the institution, black, white, and polka dot. So I had to figure out, well, what is this that's happening? 
Lenny finally landed a job with Shawmut Bank, which has a reputation for its progressive employment efforts. Today, she has her own theories why there is such a very small group of blacks who have broken into banking's upper-level management in Boston. Another thing that I think is fundamental that you read about what happens with minority in Boston in terms of why a lot of uh, people-oriented businesses don't uh, bring in minority people is that they are afraid of the way they, the minorities are going to be received by their clients. At this grand opening for Entree Computers of Boston, the only important color is green, and it was Lenny's financial expertise that made the funding for this franchise possible. We approached a number of different Boston banks, and out of all the bankers that we spoke to, Lenny did the best job in terms of reviewing our entire business plan, understanding the philosophy behind what we were doing, the marketing strategies that we were going to employ, and she just bent over backwards to do a real good job for us. Lenny says she is happy at Shawmut Bank, and Shawmut Bank representatives say they are really trying to improve their employment picture. But in a city where the population is 22 percent black, the statistics for minority employment in Boston's banks are shockingly low. Very good. Congratulations. The 1981 federal figures for the greater Boston area include the 92 cities and towns around Boston. But most of the banking industry is in Boston, and only 7.8 percent of that workforce is black. In all of Greater Boston's private industry, only 6.5% of employees are black. And in high tech, the fastest growing industry in the area, only 3.6% of employees are black. The overwhelming majority of all these people are located in low paying office, clerical or service positions. Not surprisingly, only 3% of Boston's corporate policymakers are black, and that number is less than many other major metropolitan areas. Corporate leaders claim that Boston lacks qualified minority candidates, yet Boston has nearly the same percentage of blacks as New York City, and they have higher education levels than blacks in many major cities. So what is it that makes them uniquely unqualified to work in Boston? I think in, in large part inadequate attention to the problem, uh, and in some instances, out-and-out -out employment discrimination. No question about it. I have spoken with some employers who've told me, it's none of your business and I'll, I'll hire who I want. Unfortunately, that wasn't the view of the Congress of the United States when it passed Title VII. Some business leaders in Boston are demonstrating that they do provide equal access. At Shawmut Bank, Chairman John LeWare has set up a model program using aggressive recruitment and strong training programs. About 19% of our total employment are minorities, uh, principally blacks, because they are the largest uh, minority group. Uh, we are in the process of revamping our own internal affirmative action programs to put more emphasis with the line officers on their responsibility for executing affirmative action programs within their units. And we're doing this by building into their performance evaluations a heavy weighting toward the achievement of affirmative action goals. Thank you. If there were more blacks at the top, I would not be looked at and scrutinized. And I, I will not be having the burden of bearing an entire race on my shoulder if in fact I stumble or if in fact my slip is showing. So the more of us that are there, I think the better off we are as an individual. As Boston's changing skyline can attest, business is booming in the construction and trade industries. But until recently, union brotherhood was reserved for whites. I mean, as you can see around the building, it's just there's not too many minorities on this job. But last year, it was I saw a lot of minorities in all the different trades over on the other side of Harvard. But I guess it's just where you are and who you work with, you know, what company you work with. For years, unions found ways to exclude minority members. In 1980, a federal court in Boston found that the iron workers were giving a highly subjective oral exam to applicants that, not surprisingly, blacks almost always failed, no matter how well they had done on the written part of the exam. And the only real way that minorities have really been able to get into union is through someone acting as an advocate. The Contractors Association of Boston is a minority trade association. It tries to make sure that black companies get a fair share of the contracting jobs in Boston and also acts as an advocate to help minorities get into unions. One of its success stories is electrical trainee Mike Fortune. There are minorities that are interested in doing this kind of work. So I believe if they 
If they got a chance, they could come in and, and do a good job, just like anybody else. Today, union leaders participate with the Contractors Association's programs that help minorities get into union apprenticeships and survive potential harassment once they're there. Let me get my tattoo here, right? Yeah. Uh, Marlboro country. <laughs> harassment of minorities has been common practice in Boston's unions, including name-calling and dropping pieces of equipment on the person in an attempt to frighten them into leaving or provoke them into a fight that might get them fired. Mike Fortune's experience has been much more positive, today, and today huh? he has hope for the future. Nice. I do. I think it's opening up, and I hope it continues to open up. You know, because who's going to speak for us, for the working class man, for the blue collar worker? Who's going to speak up for us if we don't have the unions? The city of Boston now has a hiring policy requiring that 50% of all workers on major construction projects be Boston residents. At the new Copley Complex, a program was set up that not only hired many minority workers and contractors for construction, but also set minority goals for hiring permanent employees and leasing business space. Lei Mei Yu is one of 800 people who got a new job in the new Marriott Hotel and Copley Complex. This year, you know, I go to employment. I look at a lot of people on the line. And then I go to ask, what, what, what happened? He say, oh, Maria Hotel, uh, they want to, you know, want somebody go to work, you know, and you can apply the job. So I go to on the line, then I apply the job. I'm lucky. <laughs> Like many Chinese women, Lei Mei took a job in the garment industry when she first came to Boston 16 years ago. But foreign competition and the expansion of large institutions like Tufts University drove most of the garment industry out of Chinatown and left Lei Mei and hundreds like her jobless. Her husband Charles commutes to Rhode Island six days a week to work in the small restaurant he shares with two partners. Well, for example, myself, right? My family is. I only see my kids uh, on my day off. When I, by the time I go back home at, uh, suppose I, at midnight, about 12.30, my wife is asleep already. But even with 12-hour days, Charles considers himself fortunate. In the overcrowded Chinese food business, many people commute by van as far as Maine, Vermont, and Connecticut, and only return to their families in Boston once a week. When Lei Mei landed her job at the Marriott, it took a lot of pressure off their family. With unemployment rates for minorities over 11%, the city has begun to aggressively recruit the business community's help. It's a two-way street, and I think this effort was, was certainly put together, the development of Copley. It has to be money, it has to be uh, uh, politics behind it, too, and the community as a whole. So it's economics, or it wouldn't be here. Many schools and community service agencies are now using English as a second language classes for Asians, Hispanics, and Haitians as a training ground in business and technology for future employment. But while the city is now supporting more training programs, and these programs are helping, for many people, the problem is not an inability to break the language barrier. It is an inability to break a barrier of a different sort. Well, there's a serious underrepresentation of minorities in the workforce in Greater Boston. Uh, we are certainly targeting and will be initiating charges against a variety of companies. Uh, and what the business community can expect uh, when, as those charges are issued and investigated, if they talk to one another about them, is that they won't be able to figure out who we're going to come after next. In Boston, one of the biggest employers is one of the biggest offenders, the city itself. With the black population over 22%, the fire department employs 11% blacks, the police department 8%, and the traffic and parking department only 6%. The departments of public works and parks and recreation employ 8% each, and the Department of Health and Hospitals, which employs by far the largest number of minorities, 24%, shows over 90% of them in the low-paying messenger service. Getting a job in city government often depends on who you know. That's what they call the political patronage system. And today, who you know is usually Irish in the police, fire, and parks departments, or Italian in the public works and building departments. One of the reasons why there's been a lot of hostility in the city has been because the 
black community, Latino community, Asian community is saying, hey, we have some rights to access to those resources as well. Mayor Ray Flynn has promised better distribution of Boston's resources, not only city jobs, but the city services that people in those jobs provide, services often lacking in minority communities. Flynn has made several minority appointments to key positions in his administration, and Carmen Pola now runs his newly created Office of Constituent Services. To work with racial problems, to go to a fire, to make sure that the streets are plowed and the potholes are filled. That is our role here. Uh, our other role is to compile all that information and provide the mayor with that information so when policy is being developed in the different departments and at the mayor level that all these issues are taken into consideration so we no longer develop policy in a vacuum. As the highest ranking Hispanic on Flynn's staff, Paula sees herself as a voice not only for her own people but for all of Boston's poor. But you don't have to be poor or out of a job to feel uncomfortable in Boston. Melvin Hollis is an assistant to the president at Harvard University. Like many minorities, he finds the Boston area a difficult place to live. I find that there are just huge pressures uh, for minority people to check their minority nests at the door uh, and become something else once you're inside those doors. I just find those pressures are probably the kinds of pressures that account most for the high level of stress that I find here among um, black professionals. Well, first of all, I would think just the racism, just the feeling that there are areas or parts of the city where it's not safe for you to go, even if nothing has ever happened to you. There's a kind of tension that you carry with you that makes you a bit more on edge. This reputation for violence makes it difficult to keep or to recruit minority talent in the city. And according to John LeWare, former head of Boston's coordinating committee, The Vault, that concerns business leaders. I guess the example that I've cited often is uh, going to Fenway Park for a night game. And uh, if there are 28,000 people in Fenway Park, you have a difficult time counting 100 black faces. Uh, uh, I'll feel I'll feel that blacks have gained more confidence about their environment when that, uh, when that changes a little bit. It's a damn shame. Uh, we shouldn't have that, uh, not, not in Boston of all places. The same thing goes on in the corporate sector, the same thing goes on in the academic sector, the same thing goes on in the public sector. Quiet fears about which taxi cab will stop, which restaurants and bars will serve you, or which neighborhoods are open also haunt Boston's minorities. Out of the 70 towns and 17 cities that make up the Boston SMSA, there are only three that have over 5% anything other than white in them. Now that is more efficient segregation than the South ever developed. Melvin and his wife have lived in many metropolitan areas, in integrated suburban neighborhoods. But in the Boston area, although money was not an obstacle, every realtor they approached took them right to Roxbury. Today, unsure of their desire to stay, they live in a nearly all-white area, and that disturbs Melvin Hollis. If I were in the process of raising a family right now, I would have some hard decisions to make because I want my children to live in a society where they meet black folks who are making decisions and who have control over their lives. Uh, they will meet white people who are doing that. They will meet Asian people who are doing that. They will meet females who are doing that. But it's very important for me to be able to point to an effective, a lively group of black professionals because that's what I want my children to aspire to.
When the buses rolled through the streets of Boston in September 1974, they carried students charged with the mission of desegregating the public schools. And they were met with hostile confrontations and attacks that unleashed an atmosphere of racial violence that permeated the city, spreading hate, anger, and fear. The violence would escalate, and Boston gained a national reputation as the most racist major city in the country. The issue was not transporting children to and from school. The issue was integration, which was thought by some to be a violation of neighborhood rights. So the violence that came from busing could also be described as turf wars, because many of the residents of Boston's neighborhoods, like predominantly Irish South Boston, Dorchester or Charlestown, Italian East Boston, and other all-white enclaves, perceived themselves and their communities as separate and entrenched in their own ethnic identities. I wouldn't say that each ethnic group was assigned only to one neighborhood. That would be silly. But there were patterns, discernible patterns, and that's where folks lived, and that's where you went to school, and that's where you prayed if you were religious, and that's where you went to the store if you had any dough, and that's where you had your fights and your first girlfriends and boyfriends or whatever. These people do not travel back and forth to Europe every year. They don't give to the Boston Ballet every six months. They didn't have that much in terms of material goods. They had their neighborhood. And when that's threatened, you can't expect anything but an antagonistic, if not violent, reaction. And it was court-ordered busing that turned these close-knit neighborhoods into armed camps. The hostile response proved that Boston was no different than any other city in resisting social change. The hostilities created by busing intensified during the late 1970s, when minorities with growing incomes and middle-class aspirations began moving into all-white neighborhoods like Dorchester, Hyde Park, West Roxbury. And the violence in these communities was probably more terrifying because it threatened people where they lived, in their own homes. We had windows broken out. Uh, I had my car turned over in front of my door. They just literally took the car, flipped it over on, on the top. Uh, there were cans and hockey sticks thrown up in my yard with nigger written all over them. Um, I had, during one year alone, I think I had five antennas, I mean, f five windshields broken out, one of my vehicles or another, between the car and the truck. I had about five windshields broken out. Uh, another night, they took a car and literally just ram one of my cars right in front of it, just drove right up the street and drove right into it and, and pushed it about 50 feet up the street. Um, there were all sorts of things. Kirk Johnson lives next to Ross Field in Hyde Park. He moved there in 1978, and his was one of several families that was terrorized for over four years. Although the neighborhood is quiet now, Kirk's description of the violence he and others experienced portrays the tenor of the times. Incidents of harassment, vandalism, stonings, and beatings began to occur on a regular basis and reached such critical proportions that it seemed as if no one would be safe traveling through alien parts of the city. That is, blacks were unsafe in white neighborhoods. And whites were in danger in black areas. I spotted them and I started to speed up and then apparently they, uh, just as I came up alongside them, they hit the, started breaking the glass in the car and uh, causing me to lose control because they hit me as well as the glass in the car. The Boston Police Department in 1979 responded to the crisis by establishing the Police Community Disorders Unit, a special corps to investigate racially motivated crimes. This expert unit patrols the city and provides protection and surveillance of areas with problems. A good percentage of our problems is, is with the kids. And, the good, and they figure they're never going to get caught, because usually they, it's a coward act anyways. They're out there breaking windows after you know the sun goes down, after it turns, after it's dark. And they figure they're never going to get caught. And that's the biggest thing we make, is we let them know that we know what they did. Uh, And that really makes a difference. Just by identifying these kids, we've been able to <clears throat> calm areas down. 
But to really deter these kinds of crimes, legal punishments had to be instituted. And the Massachusetts legislature passed a Civil Rights Act which carried civil and criminal penalties for anyone using force or threats of force to deprive an individual of his fundamental rights. In 1982, the black residents of Hyde Park used this law to prosecute six white youths. An injunction order and stiff sentences were handed out, with three of the men serving time in jail. Watching these youngsters playing in the park offers an indication of how much things have changed in the neighborhood. But the example set by the court case did not stop racial violence in the city. And in Hyde Park, there are still reports of harassment and vandalism. In fact, one of the first issues to face Mayor Ray Flynn after his inauguration was racial strife in the neighborhoods. This time, it was at Wainwright Park in Dorchester. We're going to deal with this problem, right? And that playground down there, it's going to be open for everybody. No also in Dorchester, a black family moved on Lonsdale Street in an all-white area, and the white families did not take kindly to that kind of encroachment on their neighborhood. The black families live up on Wells Ave, and they're trying to come over from Dorchester Ave, and all the white families right here don't want them to do that. They come down. One moved in on Lonsdale there. That's why they threw the bricks at the house. They don't want them down across the avenue. When Betty Dixon and her family moved into their apartment, they didn't know they had crossed the dividing line. But they soon felt the wrath of their neighbors when bricks began flying through their windows. I mean, you feel if we had that much hate to, to, to crash someone's windows, not knowing that who was in there, that there was children involved, it didn't matter, and then they come and do it repeatedly, then you really intended on hurting someone. And, and if they had that much hate to them then, and then the fact that they went to court, and they were given some sentences and whatnot, they may even hate us more for the fact that, or the, because of that fact, because now they got punished for harming us, whereas they felt they were doing right, and they just didn't want us here, and we don't belong here. And um, it's just scared. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I try not to show it in front of my kids, but I do have that fear in me, whereas I'm afraid, and I'm never comfortable living here. Frightened or not, the Dixons are determined to stay on Lonsdale Street. Their determination was given a boost when Mayor Flynn came to visit and console them during their last episode of violence in February. The mayor's visits to racially tense areas, his clear message that violence is no longer acceptable in the city of Boston, and his insistence that all parts of the city be accessible to all citizens has had a positive impact on Boston's racial climate. Racial harassment or racial violence in our city is not going to be tolerated, and the administration stands behind every kind of effort uh, to swiftly uh, deal with the prosecution of that effort and I've instructed the police department to do that, the community disorders unit to do that as well. He's the first mayor to demonstrate an active role in putting the city's resources behind quelling racial strife. However, when we recall the attacks this summer on an MBTA bus driver in West Roxbury and an interracial couple in Jamaica Plain, it's easy to see that Boston has a long way to go before it rids itself of racial violence. But the problems that minorities experience in integrating neighborhoods are not limited to violence. The more subtle and insidious way to keep people out of all white communities is through discrimination in real estate sales and rentals. Yeah, uh, you want to... Hi, I'm Mike Matthews, and this is my wife, Dina. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, what do you want? Oh, I'm here about the house. Uh, we were driving by, and we saw the sign, and uh, we'd like to look at it. The house? This house? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, come on. Uh, listen, uh, wait a minute. My real estate agent is supposed to handle this stuff, okay? Uh, listen, call uh, Bill Willis, Newhouse Real Estate, all right? Have a nice day. Look, but wait. This film, jointly produced by the Boston Fair Housing Commission and the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, is used as a tool to educate realtors. It provides graphic examples of steering and other forms of discrimination. Although the film points out that discrimination is illegal and is punishable by fines and loss of license, housing discrimination in Boston is rampant. The investigations by the Fair Housing Commission and the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination prove that emphatically. Here's the test we just ran. Three out of four chances of being discriminated against if you're black. Being denied housing, being given different terms and conditions if you're trying to rent it, or being steered away from the prime housing or white people housing. We found that out. We have documentation. We interviewed a real estate agent who declined to appear on camera, but she agreed with Rodriguez's assessment. 
She said agents don't want to offend their clients of their neighborhoods by showing blacks or Hispanics or Asians houses in some areas of the city. The agent added, I don't think the people in Boston are that serious about changing those practices. The only way to really stop it is to strictly enforce the law and give out fines, say $500 or $1,500. That would put a stop to a lot of it. Since the institution of the Fair Housing Commission and the change in administration of the MCAD in 1982, both agencies have rigorously pursued housing discrimination and produced results. We know housing discrimination takes place, not only in Boston. In fact, it's getting better in Boston. More of Boston is opening up. Sure, we have the tight areas. Everyone knows South Boston is not going to open up immediately. There are some other areas in the cities. But we're also able to point to suburban towns now and suburban cities now that practice the same thing. And I'm optimistic because with the message we're sending out, people are beginning to phone us. Real estate people are phoning us saying, listen, somebody just tried to give me a housing order and said, don't rent to black people. I want you to know who did it. And they phone in and they're turning people into us now. We're making progress in this field, not fast enough. Boston considers itself the birthplace of freedom and democracy, but it has always been a divided city. The history of Boston and its neighborhoods is an unending story of immigration, strife, and economic struggle. What you have in Boston is a long history of bigotry, of one class against another, one ethnic group against another, one color against another, one religion against another. From the time the Yankees landed here in the 1600s, they had problems with other Yankees. Memories of that conflict linger. People still talk about the Brahmin Yankees and the Swamp Yankees. And colonial Boston, home of the liberal abolitionist, was also where the first slave ship was built in America. Black people have been in Boston um, from almost the time of European settlement. They've been here since 1638. And for the first, uh, uh, really, century, um, they lived all over the place because there were slaves, and so they lived wherever someone bought them, where the masters lived. Opposition to slavery began as early as 1701 in Boston. The Revolutionary War, in which many free blacks fought, was its death blow. This is the African Meeting House, the oldest black church building in America. It's located on Smith Court on Beacon Hill. This neighborhood on the north slope of the hill is where the black population settled in the 1700s. On the front side of the hill were the houses of the wealthy, where many freed blacks continued to work as servants. At 10% of the population, black Bostonians lived and worked in peace for nearly 100 years. But the decade beginning with the Great Potato Famine of 1847 brought waves of starving and desperate Irish refugees to Boston. The Yankees, of course, really did a number on the Irish. And not just in terms of no Irish need apply here. Everybody talks about that. It was more brutal than that. Protestant Yankees reacted violently to the Irish in their city. Mobs interrupted one of their street funerals and later burned their Ursuline convent. The Irish were considered drunks and were associated with street crime, violence, and being on the public dole. Many cemeteries and neighborhoods would not accept them. They didn't live in the same places. The Irish, were, the, the, many of the Irish were a lot poorer than the, than, than, than the black people. I mean, so they, they didn't you know, live in the same places. 
Direct competition for jobs began between the Irish and the black populations. As the shipping and fishing industries declined, the economic struggle worsened. Fearing an influx of more freed black workers, the Irish rioted against the Civil War and lobbied against allowing blacks to carry arms or fight. After the war, the black population quadrupled, but the rapidly rising Irish population swallowed their hopes for jobs and political influence. Then at the turn of the century, waves of new immigrants arrived. When the Italians and the Jews got here, there were Irish who were dumping on them because they were the new kids on the block and they were competition for the very few jobs that existed for working stiffs in this town. The new arrivals poured into the North End waterfront. The Irish were pushed into South Boston, Charlestown, and Dorchester, and the black population moved to the less crowded residential section of Roxbury and the South End. Each new wave of immigrants met stronger resistance and the same ethnic slurs as the newcomers before them. They were labeled criminal, dirty, lazy, and above all, after someone else's job. The black population held on to the service jobs that they could traditionally get, but it became increasingly difficult to get the higher paying jobs like construction work. The Irish found a new way to get jobs. They registered to vote in record numbers and built a political patronage system that would guarantee them city jobs. By 1900, the city was the fastest growing industry in Boston. And with the beginning of Mayor Curley's reign in 1914, the Irish finally had access to the money and jobs they needed. Boston's Yankee merchant princes, feeling that the city was no longer theirs, began taking their money and expertise elsewhere. Uh, everything was falling apart here. I mean, it was a terrible, it was economically, it was an awful place to be. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was just horrendous, and people got, you know, shoe companies and breweries and all this kind of stuff that was around here were leaving right and left. The city went into a state of economic decline that it didn't pull out of until the late 1960s. Minorities found it increasingly difficult to get access to jobs and to the city's services or money. That economic turf war is still part of Boston today. And so one of the ways of getting access to resources was to get power in city government. And with the tax dollars, to use that as a form of distribution to get people jobs. And South Boston, one of the city's most proud and insular communities, has a long history of using political clout. They will always vote uh, based on what is in the best interest of neighborhoods and what is in the best interest of my own particular family and the extension of my family, which is my own neighborhood. And I think a lot of people feel that way. If you want to keep your, your ethnic identification and, and work toward that, and that's a part of your heritage, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but recognize that there, there are other groups, there are other races, there are other uh, ethnic groups and cultures uh, that have to be recognized and accepted as a part of Boston as well. It's not going to be all Irish or all Italian or all black or all Hispanic or all Asian. It's all of these together.
Mel King's campaign for mayor last year marked a new high point for minority participation in Boston's electoral process. When King received 34 percent of the vote and came in second in a field of nine candidates, it put him in a runoff with Ray Flynn. It also made him the first black person ever to come that close to being mayor of the city of Boston. I have lost the mayor's race, but I have been privileged to represent the Rainbow Coalition. Although Mel King lost the election, his campaign demonstrated that minority candidates could be elected if backed by a strong coalition vote. It also indicated that minority participation in Boston politics was taking on new dimensions. I don't think there's any question about the impact of the uh, campaign. In terms of people of color uh, going for power and saying that they have a right to that power in this city, it has the kind of impact that uh, is, uh, for me, very, very significant. Gaining access to political power has been a continuous struggle for Boston's minorities. At the turn of the century, when the black population on Beacon Hill had become large enough to elect its own city councilor, the district lines were redrawn or gerrymandered so that the black community's vote was split among white ethnic wards. Blacks did not elect a representative to city council until 1949, when Lawrence Banks won the Roxbury seat. However, the paper ballot in election was disputed, and Banks was not seated until 1951, three months before the end of his term. After that election, the city charter was amended so that council seats would be elected at large rather than by district. Because the at-large system favored the majority population, another black city councilor would not be elected until 1967. At the height of the civil rights movement, Tom Atkins was the first and only black person to be elected to the at-large council. Atkins won two terms, and in 1971, he ran for mayor and lost. However, blacks were credited with providing the swing vote that helped Kevin White defeat Louise Day Hicks in 1971. On the state level, the black vote was more successful in electing its own representatives since state reps are elected from districts. Since 1866, Boston blacks have served in the legislature at various times. Today, they include Senator Royal Bowling Sr. and Representatives Royal Bowling Jr., Doris Bunty, and Byron Rushing. Although the state of Massachusetts and the city work hand in hand, it's really the city that directly provides neighborhood services to the people. And the minority community wanted and needed access to Boston's elected officials in order to get their fair share of the resources. But gaining access took a three-pronged effort of community organization, litigation, and voting. Uh, the fact is that you get rewarded for voting. Uh, not for being a citizen uh, with rights. You have to vote, you have to be connected to a party or to a person who gets elected, and then they work in your interest. For minorities to even get a representative accountable to them, district council seats had to be reinstated. This was accomplished by a referendum vote in 1981. As a result, there are now two black city councilors, Bruce Bowling and Charles Yancey, and their presence is making a difference. My question still remains, to anyone who cares to answer it, do you believe discrimination... The chair is going to rule the council of out of order for the following... Oh, I think uh, dealing with the two councilors, Bowling and Yancey, I think, you know, they have a different perspective and you learn. It's a, for us um, councilors who represent a uh, majority of uh, white individuals, we learn. I mean, we're all working together. The best part of the new district councils is that we're not running, running against each other and we talk to each other about our specific problems that deal with our districts. At the Boston School Committee, it took the litigation of the 1974 desegregation case to bring about change. One of the major reasons for the school fight was because of the fact that the school system was run by political elected people, and the people who were elected came from other parts of the city and had no black representation and no interest in the affairs of black people. In the past, Every person from the janitor to the school teacher to the principal had to be approved by the elected school committee and they did it in executive session. So the deals were made and we were left out. John O'Brien was the first black to be elected to the school committee in 1977. He has served as chairman and now serves with three other minority members, Jean McGuire, Shirley Hicks Owens, and Grace Romero. The result of being in that position 
I was able to monitor things. I was able to get implemented for the first time in history an affirmative action program, which they never had in the city. I was able to uh, help people gain access to the system, black and other minorities who've never had access, not in the way of jobs, but just to get information. So that it has had an impact in the way of more people having access to the system. The newest group to make a bid for access to Boston's political power is the Latino population, and they are registering to vote in record numbers. I was watching the Democrat convention going on, and it just got you all psyched up to do something about it, so decided to come and do it here. In the Hispanic community, uh, we're going through a process now of um, development, politically, political development, but also a fast change of leadership. The organizing that is happening now, I mean, the interest on voter registration, it's incredible. Although Hispanics are estimated to be only 8% of the city's population, they make up the fastest growing segment in Boston and in the country. Like the black community, Hispanics are gaining in political clout. And those, and, and the politicians understand that they must deal with our community on an equitable basis. This is, this is a big change from the past. In the past, we've received a lot of lip service. They used our names. They had some of us hanging around the politicians, but it wasn't real. Now it counts. Now we actually have votes that we can deliver, actual votes on election day. Politics in this country influences just about everything that we do. It touches upon all our lives. It touches the kind of housing we have, the kind of jobs we can get, the type of education, the quality of the education that we get, the quality of the health services, the abundance of all these things, the jobs, the work, the resources, the development. Politics touches upon, influences that, controls it in many instances. So unless we as a community are involved in that, involved in the political process, we are not going to share equitably in this society. During the first 11 months of Ray Flynn's administration, it seemed as if he was everywhere, promoting his campaign to bring better services to neighborhoods, fashioning a new image of the city, and developing new priorities for government. I think that this city uh, has to have uh, a, a policy where everybody's rights and everybody's opportunity to have access and to frequent any place in the city is, is absolutely paramount and it's critical. Without that, nothing is going to fall in place access is the is the key issue minority access to the Flynn administration has been demonstrated in many symbolic and tangible ways however the appointments of blacks like George Russell as city treasurer Leon stamps as auditor Doris Bunty as director of the Boston Housing Authority and other minorities to key positions are perhaps the most significant evidence of the mayor's goal to include people of color in city government Flynn has appointed more high-level blacks than any other Boston mayor, but he has not yet kept his campaign promise to make his administration's employment statistics reflect the ethnic percentages in the city. As of August 1984, minorities made up approximately 18% of the city's workforce, and that's considerably less than their 35% of the population. And Mayor Flynn is criticized for not having an aggressive affirmative action program. 
You have many departments with very few blacks and Hispanics in it. You have uh, many departments where there are no uh, blacks or Hispanics in key management positions. And while he apparently is doing somewhat better than Kevin White, uh, he has not uh, achieved the goal of ensuring that the makeup of City Hall is reflective of the population of the city as a whole, particularly in the area of higher management positions. Mayor Flynn, however, points to his record in compliance with the Boston Jobs Ordinance as indicator of his efforts to increase jobs for minority residents. This order, which covers construction projects receiving city funds, requires that 50% of all jobs go to city residents, 25% to minorities, and 10% to women. Flynn's record shows that 44% of these workers are city residents, 32% minorities, and 4% women. So in the area of access for minorities in the city workforce or people or, or city-sponsored programs and construction jobs and so forth, we're making remarkable progress in that area, and I'm very, very proud of it. That's not to suggest, however, that we can't do more. The economic benefit of having Boston residents employed by the city is obvious, but this policy has had additional impact on neighborhoods like West Roxbury, Hyde Park, Neponset. These are the areas where the higher paid city workers live. And ironically, those are the areas that have historically received the best services, or the, receive uh, deferential treatment with regards to um, uh, garbage collection, street cleaning, uh, and police protection. So I think it makes a difference in terms of how the services are delivered on the one hand and the level of employment uh, on the other. Providing adequate city services is becoming increasingly difficult with the budget constraints placed on the city. But groups like the Black Political Task Force are monitoring this administration to make sure that the minority communities get a fair share of Boston's resources. I would like to see him do a good job um, because um, we think, uh, the task force thinks that the, the, the communities of color need goods and services. We need jobs. We need education. We need housing. We want to see the mayor succeed at the programs that, he is, that he's done. If he fails the black community miserably, um, we think the black community will make a statement that will dump him out of office. The increased political participation of Boston's people of color has become more visible during this first year of Mayor Flynn's term. And he has taken a leadership role in dealing with the concerns of these groups. Most notable has been his effort to provide a plan to create a city council seat that would represent a primarily Hispanic population. Some of the political rhetoric from minorities may seem militant, but it is not hostile. In fact, the minority communities realize that they have much in common with Boston's other ethnic neighborhoods. My concern is that those working class neighborhoods, the Roxburys and the Charlestowns and the East Bostons and the, the Dorchesters and the South Bostons and Rosendales and Jamaica Plains, those communities begin to work uh, more effectively together dealing with the real issues that impact all of them. High unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, uh, improved city service delivery, improved uh, housing. These are the things that, that tend to divide people, that tend to divide neighborhoods more on artificial lines than substantive lines. The real challenge here is to bring those people together, including the business community, including the neighborhoods of the city, and build those bridges. That's very, very important for the stability of the city of Boston. The choice facing the city is a basic one. Do we want to reap the rewards offered to us by the growing diversity of our population, or do we want to continue to, re to suffer the very negative consequences of continued racial exclusion and racial division? Uh, and there are very high social costs to that, and I would submit to you a very high economic cost. I've seen the city polarized. I know what it does to this city and what it does to its people. It just, it's, like a, it's like a peg going through somebody's heart.
Houston now has in place many of the mechanisms needed to protect the rights of its diverse population. However, abuses continue. Residents are still being attacked for racially motivated reasons. Discrimination and housing and employment still exist. And minorities are still made to feel unwelcome at many of the cultural and recreational activities in the city. So for many of its blacks, Latinos and Asians, nothing has changed in Boston over the last 10 years. But when you step back and look at the fact that there is minority representation in government and minorities are now holding jobs or living in neighborhoods that were previously reserved for whites only, it's easy to see that progress has been made. Unfortunately, that progress is not enough to erase Boston's stigma as a city that's hostile to its ethnic minorities. For Boston to rid itself of that reputation, it's going to take more than politicians, laws, and commissions. It's going to take a change in the attitudes and behavior of this city's residents and its business community. No city can truly thrive when its population is divided, economically, socially, or geographically. Crime, fear, an unhealthy business environment are the price Boston has paid for those kinds of divisions. So it's in everyone's best interest to create an open and accepting environment for people of all races, colors, and creeds. Boston's leaders seem to be working toward that goal, but it's going to take the vigilance and voting by minority communities to ensure that equitable representation continues to be a priority. When all of Boston's residents work to create an open city, then and only then will Boston be able to prove it's changed. I'm Liz Walker. Good night. For a transcript, send $2 to Boston's Changing Face, WBZ-TV, 1170 Soldiers Field Road, Boston, 02134.